Hello, in this video I plan to go over conditional statements, so basically if, and loops in Rust, and also a little bit logical operators. So I already recorded this video once, and the thing that I ended up getting bogged down with was, of all things, loop labels. I got right to the end of the video and I messed it up, and finally I thought, well, it wouldn't be a bad thing just to re-record this anyway. So let's go ahead and start by looking at logical operators. So logical operators. And these are the same as C++. So if I do print line exclamation mark, I think I should be able to print out Booleans just with curly brackets like that. Let's try true and and false, which of course should be false. So this is the logical and, and if I run it, yeah, we get false. Similarly, we've also got or, so that's a double pipe. This should be true and if this is false and I put a not in front of it, we should get true. So we should get false, true, true. Let's try that. There we go, false, true, true. So that's exactly the same as C++ or Java. The next thing I want to look at is if statements. There are also if expressions in Rust. We'll take a look at those after this. And there aren't any real surprises here, I don't think. Let's say let temp equal three maybe. So I'm going to say if temp is less than zero, notice there are no round brackets there, print line freezing, and then you can have an optional or multiple optional else if blocks and an else block. And it's exactly like C++ apart from the lack of round brackets here. So we'll have else if temp is less than four, and we'll have an else at the end. So if I duplicate that and just move it down, let's get rid of the terminal temporarily. This is how it looks, if, else, if, else. I'm pretty sure I've got this right. And here I'm going to say cold, and here I'm going to say warm. <laughs> it's not really warm, uh, unless these are the temperatures of a fridge. But that'll do for illustration purposes. So if I bring up the terminal again and run it, that works. So no surprises there, I think, apart from the lack of round brackets. Then we've got if expressions, if expressions. These are similar, but not quite the same as what you find in Kotlin and Python. If you were doing Java, C or C++, you would use the ternary operator instead. So let's say let advice equal, then we have an if, and the point of these is to set a variable to one of two possible alternatives. So now we have a condition like, let's say x less than 21, and we have curly brackets, and in there we have something that we want to set this variable to if this condition is true. So let's set this to take jacket. Then we have an else and let's say it's warm. Above 21 I think in the UK would definitely count as warm. So a couple of things to notice here. One is that there's no semicolon right here after the values we want to set the variable to. And the other is that these both have to be of the same type, otherwise the type inference isn't going to work. Let's just see if it works. So print line, and I think I would have to use this kind of syntax with the curly brackets, and I can put advice right there. Let's try that. X not found in this scope. Oh yeah, I meant to say temp. All right, that should work, I think. Still doesn't work because I forgot the semicolon at the end of this line. Okay, let's try that. Yeah, take jacket. So this whole thing is an expression right here. In other words, it boils down to a single value, which in this case I am assigning to a variable. Which value it boils down to is going to be one of two choices, either this or this. As far as I know, you can't use else if here. So now let's take a look at loops. So we've got a trusty for loop in Rust, and that looks like this. So for, we need a variable like count, which doesn't have to be declared in any special way. It is declared by virtue of the fact that we're using it in a for loop. So for count in, and we can specify a range using, for example, 0 dot dot 3. So this sort of dot dot operator. Let's put curly brackets in and do print. I'll do, I'll try print instead of print line here. So I assume that should be print exclamation mark. Put in round brackets and we'll have curly brackets and count. Let's have a space following the curly brackets. I think I've got that right. Let's try it. Yeah, so we get 012. Notice that 
This includes the beginning of the range, it includes zero. It doesn't include the end of the range. I believe there is also an inclusive loop. We'll try that, but first I'm gonna have a blank line here. So let's copy this and paste that and put an equal sign there. And if I try to run this, yeah, I've got the exclamation mark right there. Let's try again. Yep, so we get zero, one, two, three. So now this does include the end of the range. I can also count down. So I'm gonna copy all of this, paste this in. And what I have to do is, I can get rid of that if I want. I have to put this in round brackets now, and then I can call what looks to me like a method. Let's try that. So we're just gonna do this. So it's gonna be an exclusive loop that goes zero, one, two, but it's gonna be in reverse. And here we get two, one, zero. Not everything in Rust is any kind of object, but it seems as though this is some kind of object. I think after this video, I'm going to look at functions a bit, and possibly in the next video, we'll also start to get onto looking at Rust's famous or infamous type system or whatever it's called, which is elaborately designed to prevent you doing bad things with memory. Now there's another couple of types of loops in Rust. Let's take a look at while loops and they work really as you'd expect. So we can say here, let count equal zero. And in this case, I'm gonna need a mutable count. So let's put mute in there. And then we can say while count is less than three or whatever, curly brackets. Let's do print line exclamation mark. Then I need all this stuff, which I'm already bored of typing <laughs> to be honest. But in this case, I need it because I wanna put a space in there anyway. So we need a semicolon there and there's no plus plus operator in Rust. And when we try to run this, we get an error, but I can use plus equals. So we'll try this. I forgot the one, put that in. Yeah, so that works and would be nicer if I just put that all on one line, except I am going to need a empty print line up here. Otherwise it's really hard to read the output. I think finally we're there. Semicolon would help. Okay, so now we've got one, two, three coming out. Starts at one because of course I'm incrementing it before I print it for the first time. So no real surprises here, apart from maybe the lack of a plus plus. Finally, we've got the loop keyword, which is a kind of brave decision because there's no way of breaking it without the break keyword. So let's have here loop. This creates an infinite loop and there's apparently nothing that I can supply here to change that. So up here, let's set count back to zero I'm going to increment count. I'll print count out right here. So print exclamation mark and double quotes, curly brackets, count. Now we're going to have to break this somehow. So I'll say here, if count is greater than five, curly brackets and we'll break. So if we try this, we get zero, one, two, three, four, five. Again, I would like to have a, a blank line though. Okay, so it looks like this and a space would be nice. And I can also use continue. So if I maybe move this down to the bottom here, then I could say here, let's just hide the terminal temporarily. I could say here, if count equals two, maybe continue. So I think that ought to be all right. So I'm always going to do the increment, but in a case where it equals two, I'm just going to skip printing it. So let's run it and we get one, three, four, five. So this is my loop now. And we have the familiar break and continue words that are in so many other languages. One last thing I want to show you is loop labels. So let's write here labels and we'll create a nested loop. So for X in, uh, let's say zero dot dot 10 and put curly brackets in there. I'm just gonna copy that, paste a version of it inside and we'll have Y in the middle here and let's print X and Y. I'm just gonna do print. I want like a uh, blank line in my output though. So print line exclamation mark up here. And here I'm gonna have a string and I want to specify X and Y. How do I actually do that? Let's try two of those and let's try passing in X and Y like this. Will that work? Possibly. So let's open a terminal and run it. Yeah, it doesn't like that, but that's just because I missed off the exclamation mark. Try again. I also missed off a semicolon. <laughs> Let's try this. Oh, it actually does work. It's, it's really hard to read this output. Let's put those together and put a line there. Okay, and 10 is just ridiculously a lot for my console here. Let's try that. 
What would help also is if I have a blank line here, I think. So if I run that, yeah, we get some sensible output now. And the point of this is to show you loop labels. So let's say, for example, that I want to break the outer loop when the inner loop is three. So the label syntax starts with an apostrophe. Let's label this outer. I need a colon there. And inside this inner loop, I can then do if y equals three or whatever, then break, and I can use the label with the apostrophe again. So break outer, fairly sure that's right. Let's run it. Yep, so this works. So although I've got this outer loop here, it's only going to do one inner loop because y is quickly going to get to three and we're only going to end up with one line of output where x is zero and y reaches a maximum of three. I wonder if I could do something like if x times y equals uh, six. In that case, I'll break. Let's try that. So that seems to work fine. So I've got three rows here, but on the third row, once y gets to two and x gets to three, we've got six. And in that case, we break and then we don't do any more of these prints. So this is how labels look. And what I discovered while trying to make this video last time was that these labels don't seem to work with while. And I did a Google search and people are saying, yeah, for some reason that's not implemented in Rust at the moment, but they do work with the loop keyword. Okay, I think that's all the syntax we're gonna cover in this video. Let's just zoom out and see how that looks. Probably won't be able to actually see anything if I zoom out, but let's see. Yeah, I can't actually zoom out far enough to show you the whole thing. But if you go to blog.kforprogramming.com, go to this article, I'll put a link in the description and click on any of the images of code. That will take you through to GitHub where you can browse this if you want. I actually discovered a fragment of an interview on YouTube with, I've forgotten who, I think it was Linus Torvalds. Is that the guy who created Linux? I wanted to say Linus Pauling, but that was a Nobel Prize winning scientist, so it wasn't him. But whoever it was, they were talking about, apparently there's a controversy with using Rust to write the Linux kernel. So I guess it must have been Linus Torvalds. Apparently some people think it should be written in C and some people think it should be written in Rust. I can see how such a controversy would arise. C is a tried and tested language. And in many ways, it's a lot simpler than C++. It's actually really nice. But then Rust does try to make all these promises about helping you not to create serious bugs, which is a good thing. Apparently Rust was named after some kind of fungus on plants, but it partly conveys the idea that you should be able to write a Rust program and just leave it and it'll carry on running for ages and ages, rusting, so to speak. And it'll work on multiple platforms for years and years and years. That's apparently the idea. And obviously that is something that you would want in Linux kernel functions. I should be saying Linux probably. And the guy giving the interview compared this to the controversy between VI or VI is the proper way to say it, I think, and Emacs. If you've been programming for absolutely ages like me, you may have encountered this controversy. There are programmers out there who really, really like Emacs. To me, Emacs seems this horrible cumbersome thing with all kinds of crazy default shortcuts. You can reconfigure it by programming in Lisp. Who wants to do that? Or at least that was true last time I really had any serious encounters with it. Whereas VI is this extremely cryptic editor, but once you learn the shortcuts, I think it's actually really good. I had a job for a couple of years, a contract, where I used VI mainly, and I started to quite enjoy using it. I don't rule out that one day I may get into Emacs, but my impressions up to this point are a bit negative of it. I just don't like the way it seems to look when most people use it with the footer and the toolbar. That's another one of my gripes. But anyway, I'm sure it is good. People do get passionate about the difference between the two. I personally prefer to use a visual editor like Visual Studio Code. Although of course, if you log into a terminal, you haven't got that option. And then I would prefer to use VI. And apparently the debate over Rust versus C for Linux has reached a similar fever pitch. Anyway, so far I have no issues with Rust. I can say I'm impressed with it so far. One thing that I'd really like to do when I've learned more of it is see how difficult it is 
to write a kind of low-level graphics program, by which I mean a program that manipulates individual pixels. So I wrote a program, I think it was for my free C++ beginners course, where we build a kind of swarm of pixels that swirl around the screen and the screen is all blurred. So it looks really nice and they change color. And I love doing that kind of thing. But a pain in the neck with C++ is that the way you install a graphics library, or perhaps even the kind of graphics library you install, is going to be different depending on your operating system. And in either case, it's probably going to be a load of hassle. And what I'm hoping is that with Rust, I can just type the name of the dependency into that cargo.toml, and Rust will download and install all the stuff I need, and I can go straight to the low-level graphics programming. It's not really that low level. I'm not proposing to entangle myself with graphics programming units, but you know what I mean. Anyway, we'll find out about that stuff later on. If you're watching this on YouTube, I'll put a link to my Substack, which at the moment is free in the description. And you can find a write-up of this and the source code right there.